calling, I'm calling Tanaka, a friend of mine, who was supposed to come and pick me up in the airport, right? And this that, Tanaka is this? This Tanaka. The one, the one, the one used to play, the one used oh, to yeah. play. <laughs> what a fail. <laughs> Carry on. So, I'm literally calling him and telling him, like, yo, I'm, I'm, I'm here. Then, for some strange reason, I turn and there's like a huge face of you. Oh, uh, jeez. Like, at the airport? Yeah, at the airport. Yeah, like yeah. a Samsung. Yeah. I'm like in Mims is staring at me. <laughs> and he doesn't seem to get it. He's like, oh, Mims is there? Like, did you talk to him about the interview? I'm like, no. He's in the billboard, dummy. Like, but but how? How how much of... Wait, before we go on. What kind of music did you grow up listening to? Everything. Everything? Um, but the main kind of music I grew up listening to was obviously what my parents played in the house, which was a lot of soul, jazz, R&B, so Luther Vandross. Hit me with some soul, hit me with some soul. <laughs> Luther Vandross, uh, Shaka Khan, Diana Ross, Tina Turner, um, Teddy Pendergrass. Teddy uh, TV is my oh, man, TV. So much good stuff. And then there, there was the... Um, there was the Kenny G's and the Kenny, Michael Kenny Bolton. G. Kenny G was smooth. Celine Dion, like all of that. So well, no, no, that's now you. That's, 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 that's now you, right? <laughs> that's now you. No, no. I, I started, you know, I came through, I got an older brother, six years older than me. And, you know, the kind of music he influenced into me was like a beautiful sort of transition from that into like underground hip hop. So, um, you know, as I started to gain my own taste, I was listening to a lot of. Um, Jeez, Talib Kweli, Q-Tip, Farrah Mosh, whoa, 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 um, whoa, whoa, whoa. M, um, Jesus, there's like so many, good, most deaf, you know, black stars. So you are, you are, you are, that's, that's me, you man. are heavy that's in me. that, yeah, so yeah, probably that's you, my scene. Are, you love the small Soquarian movement. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, so. Who are you, bro? <laughs> <laughs> that's so, so dope. That's a lot of what I grew up on, and then... They found just like a great instrumental interest in one of my favorite musicians, people like Jimi Hendrix. Um, Jimi Hendrix. I never really connected to Jimi. Uh, Jimi, yeah. Because I think like I never talent. got so rock. I appreciated the talent, like on the guy who played. Yeah. But on a, to connect to the music, I never yeah, really yeah. connected with the music. But like, you know, my taste is literally from Jimi Hendrix to, um, you know, Salif Kweli, most deaf, underground hip hop, to Frank Sinatra. Um, uh, Billie Holiday, Nina Simone, Neil Armstrong, like so, that's... But, but that's very interesting that you rock soul, jazz, and all that. Yeah. But in South Africa then you're starting to get the urban youth. We're starting something dope called yo, quite dope. Yo, yo, How yo. much of that quite dope? you're from Soweto, it's like... Th those are some of the best times in South African music. Quite let me dope. know. Let, me, let oh, us know. Man, man, that was just an incredible time of just wonderful self-expression. Uh, where the South African urban black youth had created this uh, this great sound from from what they had been experiencing and through this I guess this revolution that was happening when now they could finally be able to use their voices in the most beautiful tangible way into a sound that explained the people that they were they finally had a voice they could finally share that and make it into something that would make people feel good about themselves dance move whatever it is and you know that's how you know white dogs made people feel uh, how much of that white dog so much were you consuming at the time so much um do my sample and tkz hey, uh man, 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 They do though. They, they, nope. they, they do though. You and don't. You're not loving the hip hop that they're making nowadays. Hip hop's not quite the man. No, no. But it's hip hop's not quite the man. It it, 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 it tries, but but it tries. quite though is sadly it's just sort of slipped into the dark corner of the room. And is that not what? And it's there, the house? but it's nah. You know, it's still such a separate genre in itself. Um, but you can almost say that those big, quite loving um, people have, I guess, now divided between the two genres of house and hip hop, or you know, loved, loved both. But it's um, it's sad that that quite or ness um, just sort of disappeared, you know. So, so you are you are playing uh, you are playing sports. You're pretty much a sports guy for much of your childhood and. 
guess early high school. Until at a certain point, you try something else, which was the MC at the time. And you discover that, wait a second, like, I could hang my boots and I could pursue this as a career. What, what was it? Because this is something you grew up loving, right? Playing soccer, being a sports person. That it defined you up until this point. The transition, explain the transition to me. Because you just don't try out MC, love it, and think, you know what, I'm going to hang up my boots. That's it. Something must have happened. Or something must have really hit you off. So it was, so it was actually TV presenting. Um, that's, that's where it sort of all you know, started. And um, it's really not that deep. I, I started that because I had to find a job. <laughs> and I loved talking, and I loved people, and I loved television, and I wanted to always explore it. And um, yeah, we had a lot of financial issues back at home. And when I finished matric, my parents were like, you're on your own. We've brought you this far. We made sure you went to a good school. Um, now, fly, you know? And I had to come up with my own plan. And I'm quite a determined and ambitious person. And um, I started trying to find out as much as possible about different auditions. Um, I enjoyed sports and everything. and then. Someone had said, hey, there's a, it was actually my ex sports coach in high school who said, listen, there's going to be an audition soon for a schoolboy rugby show, and they're looking for a possible presenter, um, and I told them about you, so if you're keen to audition, because I, I, I know you were looking for something like this, um, this is when it is, and good luck. And long story short, I did the audition, they loved me, I got it, and that was that. That was that. That was that. But, but you mentioned two things in your whole explanation. Number one, you said there were issues at the house, financially. And number two, you mentioned high school. You went to a boys' high school. Yes. John's, uh, St. John's. Yes. That should have really shaped you in a lot of ways in terms of just the person you are now. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, How much of it? So I think that's a one of, was one of the greatest privileges I have been given with going to such a good school because no matter what challenges or difficulties I was going through, I had been I had enough of the I guess resources within me in my repertoire as a person, in my arsenal as a as a you know person with enough initiative to be able to make something happen from that and had all the stacks chipped in my favor as opposed to someone who um, would have been coming from a you know a much a much more difficult background or environment and trying to go into the working world. Um, small things like having good good command over the English language. You know, just being able to speak good English changes your like it's, yo. It's, it's, it's where, crazy. Yeah, where, where did thing. the accent come from? But then I remember yo, he went to Jones. Yeah, yeah. no, no, I went to yeah, uh, Fulham Boys School. Um, and it was a it was a British English traditional school, you know. And um, yeah, so you went there for prep as well. No, I was uh, I was at King Edward. King Edward. Prep. What kind of school is that? Um, it's, a, it's a it's a it's a public school. It's a government school, not too far from from, from my second school, St John's. Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. Um, and it's not like King Edward. There's, uh, there's also King Edward in the Bible, isn't it? No, no, there's Prince. Edward. Prince Edward used to play sports again. Yeah, Prince Edward is me. Yeah, like, yeah, those yeah. guys are good. No, no, yeah. nice. Yeah. So uh, that was always. Uh, Fun experience, but um, no. so you have visited them, yeah, yeah, uh, during, during your high school times. days. Um, once during my high school days, went to Harare, and then after school, went to Harare and Bulawayo a couple of times. Um, and of course, right there on the edge of Tory Falls between with you guys in Zambia. No, 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 you know, you okay, where did you see the best view? Okay, you know what, let's smash this right now. Where did you see the best view? Is it, is it from Zambia or from yeah, I saw the best view. Say it. No, you can say it to all the Zambians who are listening. It's so tricky, eh? No, it's not tricky. It depends from where. Because I saw an incredible view when I was in Livingston of, um, of the Zambezi, which is, un, you know, which is absolutely bad. But then the view, Victoria the, view, the view of Victoria Falls, the Maps, Bungie wait, 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 let me know. stop you right there. Who goes to the Victoria Falls? Maybe goes a little bit to the Zimbabwe. To see a little bit to Zimbabwe. the Zambezi. Who does that? <laughs> okay, it's like... Um, it's like going into a strip club. No, 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 but to go look at the DJ. Yeah, but that's what you are saying. But why can't you see both? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I went there and I saw the Zambezi and I saw um, Victoria Falls as well. Um, I, was about, I, I was literally about to go bungee jumping, but it was three weeks. I 
it after that woman had just fallen into. And you're like, okay, that's like, fine. Maybe I should come back another time. Yeah, a little yeah. another time. It's running late. We gotta go shoot. <laughs> so <laughs> let's not let's not try. Let's not try that. Now. Yeah. But but, but let, let's let's pick up like three three things like key things which we took away from John. Number one, from St. John. Yeah. Um, the ability to set on my own two feet, I'd say uh, the ability to analyze and think about things in an unorthodox and different kind of way. You know, people think about things in one way, how to not conform and see how you can find uh, solutionist uh, thoughts or, or types of imagination around solving certain things. Um, and then I'd say linguistic skill that actually helps a lot in terms of social skill and uh, being able to adapt to any environment. So the second thing, you mentioned that there were financial problems at home. Uh, I pick up two things from that. Number one, your dad is a legend and you know this, right? Uh, he's achieved so well in that whole sphere of soccer and all that, but it wasn't always equal to the financial remuneration like it is now, because it was a different time. Like, how, how much of that paradox really messed with you and you started to understand, like, yo, I'm grown up, this guy is really big, but we don't see the financial, um, the financial, I'm looking for the word, since you, the proportionate financial accumulation from all yes, those efforts. from essentially. all that effort. Yeah, yeah. If you're getting into a space like entertainment, where that pretty much could happen, that yeah, I mean, everyone knows you, but you are so wrong. I mean, it's, it's a different time. I mean, look, definitely it wasn't... Um, definitely wasn't like we were completely struggling or anything. I get that. Um, but, you know, we were lucky to have a house and, and, and the car and everything and he'd done incredibly well for himself. Um, but I think it was just, um, you know, it's, a, it's an attitude thing. When you're keeping up with the Joneses, when you're in the public eye, you find that pressure to spend money that you don't have. And I think we just caught ourselves a little bit in that. Um, and as opposed to learning how to save and invest and everything. And um, yeah, I learned a lot from that and it's uh, made me grow in a significant way. But, you know, to have still been able to have gone to the school that I went to um, and been able to have gotten all the things that we needed to live a good life um, made, it, uh, made it fantastic to, um, yeah, to still, be, to still be a part of it. Is that what informed um, your current discipline with money and just how you treat money? Is that right somewhere that you save about 60 or 70 percent of your income? and you've had the same car for like eight and a half years and you're really strict when it comes to money, is that why? Yeah, it, it, it is why I'm terribly frugal, so to speak, um, and uh, make sure that I invest as much as possible and save for that rainy day. Um, and I just learned to save quite well over time when I was in, when I first started making money, I used to save like 5%, then 10%, um, then, you know, 20% to a certain extent, and just build things up and manage things in a way that I wouldn't need that much to live off of um, things that are, you know, really isn't necessary to have to spend more money. Have give, have more give, money give me a practical yeah. example. Um, so no, that I, feel like, I, feel like, I feel like I'm, you know, I, for example, a car. Okay. You know, why, why if I've got my first car and uh, managed to pay it off. Why would you then have to keep changing the car every single time and continue paying more and being in more and more debt and everything? Um, and I've also always believed that you don't buy a car um, unless you're gonna afford at least five of those cars in cash. So my mentor you know? actually says, um, if you can't buy, if you can't, if you can't, if you buy anything and you can't buy it three times over, yeah. Without feeling your pocket, without looking at your pocket and thinking, no, oh, I might be spending too much, then you can't afford it. Hundred percent. Yeah. And I apply the same same thoughts, but but I try and make it about yeah four, you know. So sorry five. And you need to not to be able to feel it. Um, and you know even when it comes to clothing, for example, I love clothes and I'm always you know. Uh, 
fascinated by what I find when I'm traveling, but I, I quickly found no point in buying and accumulating lots and lots and lots of clothes when you're not going to be able to wear every single one and just buy them according to trends, whatever. I've never been a trend person. So what I've always done, even when I was younger, was just buy timeless items I could always have so that I'd never have what, to shop so what for clothes. What do you look? My emotion. Your emotion. Time. My feeling, my emotion. What, what, you understand? What are you feeling now? Black Panther, brother. Hey, let him know, brother. Let him know. Black Panther, let him brother. Know. Let, let him know. Um, and also, like, very... I think I'm just in a very... Um, mellow phase right now where I can still achieve sort of a certain le level of like casual formal strength through um, an all black formal casual look like this right now um, and it kind of dictates that um, for me that I feel like I'm quietly in control in an understated way um, but yeah but um, then I finally now finally um, have I've gotten a new car because, like, you know what? Treat yourself for once, and um, and now I'm uh, definitely going more and more into um, you know, looking at more property, trying to grow that as well. Getting into ownership. Um, I mean, look, I've owned already, but you know, trying to build that up in a in a big way, make it more substantial exactly. and all that. And I mean, the amount of money you can save off of, you know, your people at the club and everything. I've got nothing to prove to, to anyone, you know. I, I don't live I like for other that. people, I live, See, I I live like for myself. That. Like, I've got nothing to prove. Exactly. I don't have to prove myself to you. 100%. But the pressure is real. The pressure is real if you make it real. Ooh, so. Say that again, that's a tweetable moment. That's a tweetable moment, let them know. The pressure is real if you make it real in the sense that... Um, who's putting the pressure on you? You're putting the pressure on yourself. I've never been a person who's even succumbed to peer pressure when I was in school um, because I just always thought that that was stupid. We're all, we're all different people, so why should what you do inform the way I do things? When, when was your first that girlfriend? My first girlfriend. Do you even remember? I was 18. 18. Do you even remember? Absolutely. First love, man. First love. Oh, you actually love me? Yeah, yeah. Oh, we, we were okay. together for, for four years. For four years. So throughout. See, that's what I was about to ask okay. next. Yeah. Yeah. You started parking um, gave you school. And by the time you went to college, you were already back. Like, you already had things happening. So which means you had a certain level of uh, popularity around college. That guy. Right? Yeah. But since you already said you were a girl, which means you were not really doing a whole lot of what a lot of other college kids do. It's so interesting how, and I don't know if it might be because of my mom and just how she raised me, but um, it's so interesting how I've always tried not to let that be Watch something that would affect me, you know? Um, so I've always been someone who is quite focused and Although I don't take myself seriously, I take my work seriously. And I feel like if something is gonna diverge my focus um, or you know digress my focus into where I'm trying to go by getting caught up in things where I am um, doing it because that's what's done and not because it's what will lead me to the next point of where I'm trying to get to, then I'm not gonna do it. And I found things such as that. Uh, What are the takeaways? No, what are the takeaways? Jeez, man. Um, okay. Let's do this. Check it out. The takeaways would probably be that you shouldn't allow, um, you know, what everyone else has to say to dictate um, your potential and level of potential to achieve whatever it is you want to achieve. Um, would be to continue to. Be your own person as much as possible. Um, think about how you can do things differently to um, make sure that you distinguish yourself in certain ways. Um, it would be to embrace life as much as possible. Not take things, not take things personally. How to grapple and learn with that. How to be able to build yourself into a person who can stand on their own two feet, um, void of void of judgment. Um, be about being able to put in the the work ethic to be able to 
be the person that you want to be. That, that you know you wouldn't have to be the best, the strongest, the fittest, the quickest, whatever it might be. Um, but you know the importance is that if you're willing to put in the work, that you can actually achieve whatever it is that you set your mind to. And and I think the fact that you know by being by never neglecting the people that you encounter and treating everyone that you do encounter with respect um, comes with a lot of that in return and if you're doing it for all the right reasons then then you never have to um, worry about it not working out. Are there people you're friends with in Soweto that you're still friends with now? Yeah, absolutely. We still yeah. call your phone. Yeah. Like, yo, what up? You good? Yeah, um, I mean, obviously a whole lot less. I bump into people all the time that I haven't seen in like 20 years. And you, know, and you don't make friends and everything. You don't make brand new. I'm just always so fascinated how, like, I can be taken back to those times, you know? Um, and it's obviously always a lot easier for that person to remember than it is for, for me to remember. Because yeah. they would have been told by their parents, like, so you used to play with this kid all the time. And they have a recollection of, of those times. But um, I struggle a lot with like my early, early, early childhood memories, um, where I have an incredible memory, but there's always like a little bit of, there's a lot of gaps that need to be filled. Um, that always interests me how, how I need to fill those up. My relationship with my dad has been um, interesting, you know? It's been quite fascinating. It's been good, it's been strong, it's been challenging, um, it's been fascinating. Um, there's just so many different complexities to it, but you know, it's, it's one of those things of evolving as, as a young man. And, and building up that kind of emotional connection with in a society of uh, lordes, machismo, you know, that machos. And also, do you, do mistakes you, that people make. Do you, do, you, do you, like, talk on a more personal, personal level? Like, if you're gonna ask, like, how your girl's doing, or how, how your finances are doing? Yeah, yeah, no, you share on that Absolutely, level. Absolutely, yeah. We, we share a lot on those levels, um, and we just try to be as open as possible about things. Mm. Yeah. Okay. The last question. How's your relationship with your dad? My relationship, you see, I, I didn't have, uh, my dad is very emotionally unavailable. Yeah, so we never used to really interact growing up. And he was always at work because my parents split when I was really young, so he grew up with the dad. Yeah. And he was just caring, like, he was working a lot. Yeah. So it's only now that I'm starting to know him as a man and try to get his side of the story and understand. And I didn't know how amazing he was. Yeah. And I'd overlooked that. Yeah. So it's, it's just fascinating just getting to know him now. But it's so unfortunate that I'm now older and now it's out on a whole and a whole lot I could have actually gained from it. I'm still growing up. So yeah, when, when, when is time to spend time with family, family? Yeah, you know, just, you make the time, man. You make the time. <laughs> you, make, you make the time. You know, this, this year, this is about making the time, but in the same breath, not sleeping in yourself, uh, but in the same breath, taking advantage of every small opportunity, but in the same breath, once again, um, doing the things that make you happy, that will make you better at what you do and make you a better human and preserve um, your energy and, and how you do things. So I'm, I'm literally only doing the things that I want to and things that may interest me. Last question. And some here from this interview. What's your love language? Because clearly it's not quality. So as an absolute hopeless romantic, um, yeah, my love language is uh, runs across runs across different different things, um, but it is quality time. <laughs> For 18 uh, hour days, like yo. Oh. It is quality time. We we struggle both to justify it, um, mm -hmm. and uh, I, I struggle to find that that time. And what are we looking at? We're looking at quality time. What's the information? Acts of service is a um, uh, well. big love language that I like to actually do. Um, and I think um, 
physical touch maybe? I think it'll probably be, yeah, quality time, physical touch. Yes. And this one Physical more. touch. <laughs> I'm a sentimental person to, to, to a certain extent, so I think I'll give probably be. Not gifts. Um, a certain, I don't know, sentimentality that comes attached to acts of service. Mm, true. Um, you know, it's like, you know exactly how I like something done, so. Paying you, attention to detail. So you, yeah, I'm super detail oriented, so if you're gonna get up and I'm gonna wake up and you literally done it exactly the way I I like it even though you didn't get it at the start but you know that, that's that for me is the type of active service. Um, gifts not so much um, but um, I think just any thoughtfulness is, is sometimes quite important. It's, thank you so much for spending time with Thank you very much yeah, man. I'm sorry about your diet that you don't eat but I'm gonna go into this. Um, just, uh, just, I need the food. Yeah, but, just, um, just one last thing though. <laughs> just one last thing. I'm coming from a totally different part of the world. Yes. And clearly you have uh, walked this journey further than uh, probably someone like me has. has. And uh, what, what would you say to me though, from where you are? Speaking to a person who wants to be where you are. one of my favorite examples of how I live my life okay. and how I got to this point of view in my life. When I was a kid, I'd always ask my parents, so I, was always, I, would, I would always hear people saying, it's not what you know, it's who you know. And I always had an issue with that. Like, that's not fair. What about all the people who, who don't um, know me? Who, <laughs> <laughs> who are really good at... That's funny, that's funny. Um, who are really good and whatever it is that they do, but they don't know the right people. That's not fair. What if you, um, what if you have the merit to get there, but unfortunately you don't know the right people? And that. my parents just be like, you know what? You understand when you get old. You understand when you get old. This is something you should. You should. Uh, you're just too naive to get right now. And I would grapple and grapple with it. Now try to work out what my answer to that would be. And. I think I've always just tried to work as much as possible in the dark, in the shadows, without too much noise. I'm the kind of person who likes to sort of stay low and keep firing. And I got to a point where my answer to that, because I was like, if I'm going to debate this, I need to have a really good retort to this then. How do I actually, what's my rebuttal to that kind of statement? And for me, if you're trying to make it and you are you love what you do, you're passionate about it, you're willing to put in the work, um, you're willing to just focus on whatever it is that you do and what you love um, and you know you have what it takes, then that's what it will take. You'll change that whole thing of it's not what you know, it's who you know and flip it around with those things I just mentioned, those attributes into the person that who you know wants to know because you're so damn good at what you do. They just can't ignore so, you. Uh, the person you're supposed to know will come to you. 100%. Oh, man. Yeah. So, thank you that's so much. I appreciate it. Yeah. Bobo, my name is Maps Mabunyane, and I'm hanging out with the one and only Soul Profound right here in South Africa. Thank you very much for your time, man. Thank you so much. <laughs>